Thank you for streaming Cities After, a radical exploration into the capitalist contradictions of our urban world and the many anti-capitalist futures to come. This is a Democracy at Work broadcast, and I'm your host, Miguel Robles Duran. In the last episode, I discussed how Tijuana has been transformed in the face of neoliberal restructuring that has been imposed by American control institutions. While that context was important to explain how to read urbanization as the living text of inequality, there is another layer of complexity when looking at Tijuana, and that is its attractiveness as a hub for clandestine migrants crossing over into California in search for better opportunities. Today's episode will take a closer look at the ever-growing migrant crisis along the Mexico-US border cities and its critical social environmental implications. I believe it is an issue of utmost urgency, particularly given the humanitarian disaster, the heightened American security impositions, the neo-fascist retaliations from Texas and other Republican states, as well as the political ramifications at both sides of the border. Having lived for almost 15 years in Tijuana, I got used to hearing about all kinds of issues relating to migrants from both sides of the border, and of course, across the political spectrum. It was an everyday conversation, in many ways unavoidable. Even if the topic did not come up, the border was always right in front of you. And I mean, it literally was in your face. It was not uncommon to see people jumping over the fence. And after 1995, the fence became the wall. I always try to remind people that the first wall was built as a result of President Bill Clinton's 1994 Operation Gatekeeper Initiative. This was an initiative that sought to increase security along the U.S.-Mexico border by constructing physical barriers, including walls and sophisticated fences, at various points along the border. The construction of the wall began in 1995 and was completed two years later, in 1997. The Tijuana Wall stretched for 10 kilometers, or around 6 miles, and stands between 5 and 9 meters, or roughly 18 to 30 feet high, in several places. And yes, migrants climbed it and jumped it all the time in broad daylight, with all of Tijuana as spectator. From the year that I arrived to Tijuana, that was 1983, to the year I first left, 1993, the unauthorized migrant influx at the U.S.-Mexico border altered drastically. According to a report from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency, there were approximately 40,000 Border Patrol encounters in 1983. By the outset of the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994, there were over half a million encounters with unauthorized migrants. This is a 12-fold increase in just 11 years. Of course, it comes as no surprise that this period corresponds to the amount of years that had passed since the Mexican economy defaulted on its international debt and the U.S. government began to impose on Mexico the neoliberal policies and procedures that I talked about in the last episode. I clearly recall the persuasive ways in which the North American Free Trade Agreement was promoted in both Mexican and American media 
the years before its signing. According to its very well orchestrated transnational marketing machine, the NAFTA was going to herald a new era of collaboration, of friendship, and open borders between continental neighbors. It was going to be a win-win agreement that would create the largest free trade economic bloc the world had ever seen. Let me substantiate what I mean by reading these quotes from the nation leaders that signed it. Here's the first one. We are creating a giant zone of prosperity in which barriers to investment and trade will be lowered accordingly, thus allowing all three nations to benefit from increased economic activity and improved standards of living. This was Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Second quote, NAFTA is about much more than economics and trade. It goes to the very heart of our friendship as neighbors. The spirit of friendship upon which it is based will be worth more than any other provision or article. That was U.S. President George H. W. Bush. Third quote, the trilateral agreement we have completed today recognizes the unique position of our three economies. It reflects the spirit of friendship amongst us all. That was Mexican President Carlos Salinas de Gortari. And why not? Here is a quote from U.S. President Bill Clinton, who did not sign the agreement in December of 1992, but was responsible for implementing all its principles starting his mandate in January 1993. And this is what he said. NAFTA stands for progress, for economic growth in all three countries, and for the spirit of friendship among our people. But Clinton's Operation Gatekeeper did exactly the opposite of being friendly towards Mexico. Almost as if the U.S. already knew that NAFTA would intensify socioeconomic instability and conditions of poverty on the Mexican side. After the enactment of Bill Clinton's Operation Gatekeeper Initiative in 1995, the number of Border Patrol agents on the ground were increased significantly. It deployed surveillance technology such as infrared cameras and ground sensors, it also intensified aerial monitoring, and all of these in addition to building the wall. Which, by the way, was built with Vietnam War era steel landing pads. From one war zone to another. According to the Clinton government, these measures had to be taken to deter the intensifying illegal migration by making it more difficult to cross the border undetected. Which, as you can imagine, also resulted in migrants taking riskier crossing routes, often leading to deadly outcomes due to the treacherous topography and or the extreme weather conditions of the desert terrain that fronts most of the border. Since then, the intense militarization of the border has only been accelerating and without any signs that it will slow down. The September 11 attacks on the World Trade Center gave it another significant boost. And as I'm sure all of you remember, Donald Trump made it a tabloid topic with his pernicious insistence on spending over $18 billion to reinforce and complete more than 1,100 kilometers, or around 700 miles, of border wall. But despite the billions and billions of dollars that the U.S. government has poured into physical, technological, and human infrastructure to protect the border from unauthorized migrants, the crisis has only been exacerbating into the breaking point where it stands today. In my view, a human and environmental catastrophe beyond control. Unauthorized crossings from Mexican migrants had always been the constant enemy of the U.S. Border Patrol. 
with a steadfast increase in apprehensions until the year 2000, which was the year with the highest recorded number of illegal Mexicans crossing into the U.S. A little over 1.6 million apprehensions were reported by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency that year. However, since that year, there has been a steady decrease in crossings from Mexicans. 2019 saw just about 400,000 apprehensions, which is nearly four times less than in the year 2000. From that year on, Mexican migrant attempts to cross the border were slowly being exceeded by those from the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. But also this pattern started to shift abruptly last year. And by November of 2022, just a few months ago, 63% of migrants encountered at the border were from countries other than Mexico and the Northern Triangle. Migrants from Colombia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Peru, and Venezuela are now the majority attempting to traverse the American walls. And the numbers are staggering. Today, migrant encounters by the Border Patrol are again at record high. The U.S. has super walls, high-tech surveillance systems, a fully militarized border, and since Trump, a more overt racist and violent Border Patrol, combined with the contentious activation of Title 42, which is a public health measure that was implemented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, which allows the U.S. Customs and Border Protection to quickly return individuals from Central America who are attempting to enter the U.S. without authorization. But all of this imperial might can't stop the migrant influx. President Biden's recent trip to see Mexico's counterpart had this at the top of his agenda. He is looking for an even better friendship and collaboration. But what is Mexico supposed to do? In many ways, Mexico has been acting as a migrant filter for the U.S. for at least a century. Very few of us know about the situation at the Mexico-Guatemala and Mexico-Belize border region, nor about the urban consequences of this new wave of Central American and South American migrants into the border cities of Matamoros, Laredo, Reynosa, Ciudad Juarez, Nogales, Mexicali, Tecate, and Tijuana. And I'm just mentioning the large cities with a quote-unquote estimated population greater than half a million. And I say quote-unquote because there is no way to figure out the real population of these cities. Local census data is as unreliable as Trump's sharply drawn weather charts. For example, in 2019, the census estimated that Tijuana had 1.8 million inhabitants. But when I was living there in the 1990s, some non-official estimates we're saying that the metropolitan region already housed close to two and a half million. Besides the questionable methodologies and limited resources of the Mexican Census Bureau, border cities have a superabundance of what statisticians refer to as floating population, a technical term used to describe people with transient livelihoods and no permanent address. In short, migrant workers and refugees. Mexican border cities have always harbored floating populations, and throughout the years, they have established a very intricate, formal, but mostly informal slash clandestine slash illegal infrastructures that support their survival as they attempt to cross the border into the USA. This is because migrants often find it difficult to impossible to access basic urban social services like healthcare, education, and housing. In the 1980s and early 1990s, the floating population was primarily composed by people migrating from rural areas and small pueblos, 
Some of them focused on getting a maquiladora job while they saved enough to pay a coyote to jump the wall. And others came already with money or fully determined to just try as many times as they could with coyote or not to cross the border. A coyote is some kind of a border slang for the person or organization that helps migrants cross the border without being detected by American surveillance. Coyotes charge per person and they are not cheap. I have heard numbers that oscillate between $10,000 to $25,000. And if you pay more, the service could include a working visa or even a resident card, commonly referred to as a green card, and who knows, maybe even a US passport. Obviously, throughout the decades, there have been many successful attempts to traverse, traverse the wall unseen. Just to give you one estimate, according to a Pew Research Center report, in 2017, there were 11.7 million Mexicans living in the United States without authorization. But what about the unsuccessful attempts? Tragically, thousands have died trying. According to other statistics, and this one from the International Organization of Migration, or IOM, around 7,000 migrants died or went missing while crossing Mexico border between 2014 and 2018. The majority of these deaths were due to exposure to extreme weather conditions, such as heat or cold, drowning in rivers or deserts, and exhaustion along the migration routes. And tragedies are not only deaths. Unfortunately, the most common are violent abuses and horrendous forms of exploitation. Theft, beatings, extortion, sexual assault, mutilation, and kidnapping. The large proportion of migrants with unsuccessful attempts and the many others that for some reason have not managed to leap north waited in their host border cities. Whether it was because they have not saved enough money for the coyote, or got too fearful of the journey, or simply have encountered personal problems, they had to informally settle wherever they could. And these areas were normally slums, without any form of urban, sanitary, or social service. As I described in last episode, they settled in areas close to the sites of their temporary jobs, surrounding American-owned maquiladoras, with some of the most precarious and inhuman living environments that I have ever seen. Over time, some of these slums were somehow formalized, and many others were obviously bulldozed to make space for more maquiladoras. This was one kind of urban stress that I experienced when I lived in Tijuana. But that was last century, back in the 80s and 90s. Today, the urban condition and social distress caused by migration in Tijuana and pretty much all the other border cities is far more extreme than anything I experienced back then. As it is usual, the U.S. and mainstream international media have ignored reporting about the catastrophic effects that this new migration wave is having south of the wall. Since the turn of the millennium, the influx of migrants from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador started to be a serious problem for the Mexican government and its territories, both south and northern border. Pressure by the American government to filter the search of Central American migrants, the Mexican authorities had no choice but to further militarize its southern borders, deploying thousands of troops to the urban and rural areas that have become the passageways. Dozens of new checkpoints have been placed along the Guatemala-Belize border, and investment on surveillance infrastructure has increased considerably. New legal deportation agreements were introduced between Mexico and countries down south, and legislators have been hard at work 
introducing tougher immigration laws. What the Americans have been doing to Mexicans for decades, now Mexicans are doing to its siblings from south of the border. Such is the trickle down. However, if billions of dollars in the absolute best and most high-tech military, financial, physical, human and surveillance infrastructure in the world cannot deter migrants to cross the U.S. from Mexico's northern border, what can we expect from any effort from the Mexican government to militarize its southern border? Currently, the Mexican military is ranked 30th in the terms of its global strength, however they rank that. And its total yearly budget is $11 billion. To put it in perspective, this is less than two-thirds of what Trump was planning to spend in the physical construction of the wall, or 1.4% of the 2021 American military budget. Or you can also say that the American budget is $729 billion more. I think you can begin to read where my argument is going. President Biden has asked Mexico to do its part in resolving the migration crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. He has forcefully called on Mexico to increase enforcements of its own southern border with Guatemala, take steps to reduce corruption and abuses within its migration system, and provide assistance and resources for migrants who are apprehended while attempting to cross into the United States. Mexico is again being bullied to do so, or otherwise investors would leave or an infinite amount of penalties could fall on its uncontrollable faith. Mexico is being told to use its military against the Latin American siblings that have also endured the imperialist and neoliberal impositions which have produced the economic and political crisis that most of the South is currently suffering. Undoubtedly, the primary reason that these waves of migrants are traveling north so now, apparently, Mexico has to buy high-tech surveillance equipment and use its military against them so the American capitalists can continue inflicting violence on its populations and plundering its natural resources, making everything fall further into poverty. Not only that, but now Mexico has to also absorb the costs of keeping them in the country provide them shelter, education, health services, etc. Quite a friendly favor to ask of a country with close to half of its population living below the poverty line, where more than 70% of its rural population live on less than $2 a day. A country that struggles to properly service its own population that is aghast with daily violence and capitalist-driven corruption. I seriously loathe to say this, but perhaps Donald Trump was right when he said, Mexicans will pay the wall. Now that I mention a neo-fascist, this South American migration wave has also rendered bright another face of noxious Mexican racism. As a parenthesis, many people outside of Mexico, but sadly inside of it, are not aware of how racist is Mexican society, especially towards indigenous and brown mestizo populations. Not long ago, you could be hard pressed to find any billboard that featured an indigenous body. And the famous telenovelas only featured indigenous people as servants of the white elites. And in my opinion, racism is still very prevalent. What has been more blatantly exposed in this recent wave of migration is an elite society with even stronger racist inclinations against the indigenous looking Colombian, Peruvian, Nicaraguan, or any people from whichever southern country 
that have a different Spanish accent. Like in the US, the abundant right-wing media has been accusing migrants of criminal proclivity, of uncivilized behavior, of damaging Mexican society and destroying its traditions. And also like in the US, it has been calling for a tougher stance towards migrants and a comeback of nationalist policies that emphasize a past where Mexico or when Mexico was great. It appears now that neo-fascism in Mexico might also be on the horizon. And that gives me chills. Besides the poverty conditions, the environmental downfalls, and the growing social political divisions in Mexican society, the border cities are now entering yet another phase of brutal urban transformation catalyzed by late stage capitalist dynamics. If you happen to visit one of these cities, you will see the proliferation of encampments full of migrants like a war zone you will also see the penetration and proliferation of international aid, NGOs, of evangelist churches providing charity as they try to convert migrants, of police and military forces trying to contain the migrants inside their cages, of criminal mafias trying to extort and take advantage of the vulnerable. And all of these inside cities that already have some of the highest murder rates in the world, that still have unpaved roads and lack basic services, and that for some reason continue to create small but super wealthy class as it pushes most inhabitants to the sharper edge of poverty. In the next episode, I will be talking with two border citizens, the American political scientist Fona Foreman and the Guatemalan architect Teddy Cruz. Both of them have been co-leading a cutting edge progressive project in one of the many encampments of Tijuana, where I will hope to be able to illustrate to all of you with images, the urban conditions that I have been describing since the last episode. And most importantly, I will discuss with them the different forms of activism that is appearing in the region and that could perhaps provide better and prosperous conditions to the many migrants currently stuck at the border. So please, subscribe if you haven't done so and give the program a thumbs up. Remember, this can subvert Google's algorithm so that progressive media like us becomes more present. Until next time, thank you.